on two previous heard applications. Uh, if you are here uh, to testify on an application for which the record is not already closed, please fill out uh, one of the white speaker slips to the Sergeant at Arms and indicate the name and or the LU number of the application you wish to testify uh, on that slip. Uh, we will start today with our votes. Uh, today we will be voting to approve LUs uh, 333 and 334, the Canton Park Nursing Home Rezoning in Brooklyn. Uh, the applicant seeks approval for a zoning map amendment to rezone the corner of Canton Avenue and Rugby Road from an R3X district to an R6A district and a related zoning text amendment to map a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing option one and option two. These actions would allow for the expansion of the existing building and the enclosure of a roof deck to provide uh, new space for nursing home residents. Uh, council member Eugene is in support of this application uh, and I know that the council member has uh, some remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Moya, thank you. Uh, good morning, I'm Council Member Matthew Eugene. I would like to thank uh, Chairman Moya for giving me this opportunity to speak about this project that is being voted on momentarily before the Council Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. As the Council Member representing Brooklyn 48th District, I am pleased to support the Cadon Park Rehabilitation and Nursing Center's application for a zoning map amendment and zoning tax amendment affecting property located in my district at uh, and within the vicinity of 1312 Keaton Avenue. The nursing home provides excellent care to the seniors who reside there, and I commend them for always having been a strong partner with me in the community, serving my district and serving also the seniors. The proposed zoning map amendment would make it possible for the existing roof deck of the nursing home to be enclosed so that uh, the new space can be created for programmatic uses, such as recreational and physical therapy of residents of the facility, in addition to creating new offices, a new solarium and larger dining room. I strongly support the Caton Park Nursing and Rehabilitation Center request for a zoning map amendment and a related zoning tax amendment to establish a MHI area over the proposal project area, and I urge my colleagues who serve on the subcommittee on zoning and franchises to vote in favor of the project. Thank you very much, Chair Moya. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Council Member. Uh, we will also be voting to approve LUs uh, 338, 339, and 340, the 12 Franklin Street text amendment and related special permit applications in Brooklyn. Uh, the zoning text change would map the subject block within an industrial business incentive area, while the related special permit would allow an increase in allowable floor area for industrial and commercial uh, uses, modifying height and setback regulations, and reduce the off-street parking and loading requirements. Uh, together, the application would facilitate the development of a new seven-story building with retail, office, and light industrial space. Uh, Council Member uh, Levin is in support of this application, and I wanted to turn it over for uh, a few remarks. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'm in support of this application, uh, and I encourage my colleagues to vote aye on this. Um, this is a, uh, an application that is in line with, um, uh, with the um, special permit that um, we have worked on and passed in previous iterations uh, in the north, in the Williamsburg Greenpoint Industrial Business Zone, um, which would allow for um, light manufacturing to be built as part of commercial development, um, really in the first, for the first time in many years in New York City. Um, and so this is a, an exciting tool. We're, we're thrilled that it's being used. Um, and uh, this isn't the, uh, this isn't the last application that, that is uh, looking to use this tool. And so uh, it's, it's, an exciting, um, it's an exciting prospect to have commercial development and light manufacturing uh, in our communities that people can um, continue to um, have good paying jobs and, uh, and, and advance uh, uh, skilled uh, uh, careers. And so uh, we, we appreciate the work of the applicant and we look forward to voting uh, in the affirmative on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Um, pursuant to 
Council Rules uh, 790 and 1180, we will also be filing Resolution 621 of 2018 uh, to remove it from our calendar. Uh, this application for an authorizing resolution for a franchise has been withdrawn. Uh, are there any questions from the subcommittee members uh, on any of these items? Uh, seeing none, I now call for a vote to approve the following applications, which have the support of the local council members, uh, LUs 30, uh, 333 and 334, the Canton Park Nursing Home Rezoning applicants, Applications, and LUs 338, 339, and 340, the 12 uh, Franklin Street Text Amendment and Special Permit Applications, and uh, to file resolutions, uh, Resolution 621 of 2018 to remove it from our calendar. Uh, council, please uh, call the roll. Chair Moya. Uh, aye, all. Councilmember Constantinides. Aye, all. Councilmember Lanceman. Aye. Councilmember Levin. Aye, all. Councilmember Richards. Aye, all. Councilmember Rivera. Aye. Councilmember Gordenchik. By a vote of seven in the affirmative, zero uh, in opposition, and zero abstaining, the items are approved and refer referred to the full land use committee. We will now begin our public hearings. Uh, our first hearing is on uh, Resolution 714, an authorizing resolution pursuant to Section 363 of the Charter, uh, the Staten Island Bus Franchise uh, authorizing, authorizing Resolution, uh, serving two routes in Council Member uh, Borelli's and Council Member Matteo's districts in Staten Island, uh, as well as Council Member Powers and Speaker Johnson's district in Manhattan. Uh, it would authorize uh, the New York City Department of Transportation to grant a non-exclusive franchise for the provision of bus service between Staten Island and Manhattan. Uh, these two routes are currently known as the SIM-23 and SIM-24 express bus routes and are provided pursuant to a contract between New York City Department of Economic Development and Academy Bus LLC. Uh, through the proposed authorizing resolution, DOT would assume responsibility uh, for their operation and would issue a request for proposals for the routes subject to the franchise. Uh, the authorization will be uh, effective for five years and the term of the franchise will be no longer than 25 years. The franchise agreement itself would be subject to future approval of the Franchise and Concession Review Committee and the separate and additional approval of the mayor. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application. Uh, and I call uh, Michelle Craven. And now I ask the uh, council to please swear in the panel. Do you swear or affirm uh, that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? and that you will answer all questions truthfully. As you respond, please state your name for the record. Did, I'm sorry, sir, did you fill out a, a can, can you fill one of those, yeah. So you can just you can just fill it up, but he's going to swear you in now. Do you swear or affirm uh, that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and you'll answer all questions truthfully? I do. I'm sorry. Uh, please state your full name for the record. Thank you. Benjamin Smith. Thank you. You may begin. Okay. Good morning, Chair Moya, and the members of the subcommittee on zoning and franchises. My name is Michelle Craven, and I am the Assistant Commissioner for the New York City Department of Transportation's Office of Cityscape and Franchises. Thank you for inviting me to speak on T2019-3755 on behalf of NYC DOT. This resolution would authorize NYC DOT to grant a non-exclusive franchise for the provision of bus services between Manhattan and Staten Island. This franchise would be for the SIM 23 and SIM 24 Express bus services 
formerly the X23 and X24, which have operated since 2001 under a New York City Economic Development Corporation contract. The reason for this resolution is largely procedural. When the Metropolitan Transportation Authority took over operations of seven bus companies around the city beginning in 2005, these two routes were the only routes not included. NYC EDC continued to contract with a private company to run the two routes with the expectation that the MTA would shortly fold the routes into its service. To date, however, despite several requests through the years, the MTA has yet to accept the routes. Because NYC EDC's role was meant to be temporary, the city has decided to transfer oversight of the service from NYC EDC to NYC DOT, while still seeking an arrangement from MTA to ultimately incorporate these routes into its regular service. The franchise process begins with the city council approval of the authorizing resolution, following which NYC DOT will issue a request for proposals for this service. While a different operator may be the winning proposer, NYC DOT will require the eventual franchisee to maintain existing service. Once the winning proposer is selected, NYC DOT will seek approval of the franchise agreement with that company from the city's Franchise and Concession Review Committee. Since 2014, Academy Bus has operated these routes, and prior to that, they were operated by the now defunct Atlantic Express. Recently, the MTA included route changes for these bus lines in its overall bus redesign plan for Staten Island. According to Academy Bus, this has resulted in a decrease in ridership and an increase in customer complaints. NYC DOT and EDC are currently reviewing Academy's request to return to its previous routes. With regard to funding, Academy Bus receives a subsidy through State Operating Assistance, or STOA, as well as a small city subsidy, mainly because the growth of the STOA pot has been less than the growth in Academy Bus's costs and Atlantic Express's previously since 2000. It is expected that this arrangement would continue under the franchise agreement with the entity that is awarded the franchise. While we continue to talk with the MTA about taking these routes, this resolution will help ensure continued operations. Thank you. Are you you're not just, okay, great. Uh, just a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, you had mentioned that uh, the DOT would issue an RFP uh, for the franchise. Right. Um, what kind of considerations is DOT looking for uh, in a future operator? We've listed a couple of the evaluation criteria, I think, for the RFP in the authorizing resolution, which uh, mainly is operational capability, their technical capabilities, their experience running a bus service, um, I would assume financial capability. Um, that's the general criteria. Okay. You, you also mentioned that with the new uh, Staten Island uh, Express bus routes, our ridership uh, has uh, decreased and uh, complaints have increased. Uh, can you shed some light on why uh, you, s you feel that uh, the ridership uh, has decreased? Well, with the route change, uh, the MTA eliminated some of the stops that they had been making previously, so they're picking up fewer passengers. I think they've also um, changed some of the stops towards the end of the route, so they're skipping a few places. I know also it seems like um, I know there was initially some confusion after the new bus plan took over. They had originally had the 723 and 724 drop off from 42nd Street instead of 34th, where it had been. People were unhappy about that. So I don't know how much is sort of general dissatisfaction and how much is just they're skipping stops. What, what were the reasons for the elimination of those? Uh, this was part. This was all part of the MTA's Staten Island bus reconfiguration plan. Okay. Um, it's sort of. Well, it still goes to that. So how, did you know what kind of complaints that they were receiving uh, in regards to uh, the bus service? A lot of the complaints that we have seen have been about traffic and traffic delays and originally about not making stops where people wanted to be dropped off in Manhattan. And lastly, um, how will you address uh, these issues uh, in the RFP? So currently, uh, the company has reached out, the op current operator has reached out to us about um, revising the routes to go back to the original stops. So that's something that we're talking to them and the MTA about. Um, we will probably do that in the future RFP, but we're also open to taking suggestions about additional stops. I know uh, we met with Council Member Borelli yesterday and he made some recommendations about things he wanted to see, so we may be incorporating those in the RFP as well. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, any Council members have any questions? Uh, thank you for your testimony today. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member Reynoso. Uh, thank you. Thank you.
Uh, are there any other members of the public uh, who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, uh, I will now close the public hearing on this application and it will be uh, laid over. So we are, we're gonna uh, go back and, and uh, open up the votes. Continuing the vote, uh, Council Member Reynoso. I vote aye on all. And by a count of uh, eight in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions, uh, the items uh, are approved and recommended to the full land use committee. Uh, our next hearing is on LUs 350 and 351, uh, the Batantis rezoning for property in Council Member Ayala's district in the Bronx. Uh, the applicant seeks approval for a proposed zoning map amendment for an R6 to an R7X and an R6 uh, C14 to an R7X uh, C24 and a related zoning text amendment uh, to map the project area as a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing option two. Uh, these actions would facilitate the development of a 15-story building with 100 affordable housing units and 8,564 uh, square feet of ground floor commercial space. Uh, I now open the uh, public hearing on this application. Um, Don Flagg, and I'm sorry, I'm just having trouble reading your handwriting. And Anna Velka? Okay, thank you. And would you fill out? Uh, can you say your name? Can you hit the? Ah, okay. uh, Matthew Charney from NYCHA. Got it. Thank you. Do you swear or affirm uh, that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? Uh, and please state your full name for the record. Anivelka Cordova. I do. Don Flagg. I do. Matthew Charney. I do. Hey, you may begin. Um, so. Thank you for having us this morning. Um, uh, as, can you go back one time? Okay. Uh, yeah, as, so as, uh, in May 2015, uh, the New York City Housing Authority released the Next Generation NYCHA Plan. As a part of that plan, uh, the Housing Authority committed to developing uh, 10,000 new units of 100% affordable housing on underutilized NYCHA land. This is uh, one of 12 uh, new development sites that have been announced since the release of that plan. Um, so, the, again, this project is um, uh, for 100 percent affordable housing, 101 units, including a supers unit. Um, just some basic facts about Next Gen NYCHA. Um, NYCHA residents will have a preference for 25 percent of the new affordable apartments. Um, this doesn't affect any residents, Tennessee. Um, the land will be leased under a long-term ground lease. And um, NYCHA is not putting any uh, funds into the construction of the new building. Sorry, can you just speak a little louder? Sure. Thank you. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> the uh, planning for this project began as uh, part of a Choice Neighborhoods uh, planning grant that NYCHA received, um, Make Mott Haven Transformation Plan. Um, the uh, uh, NYCHA was not awarded the implementation grant by HUD. <clears throat> but there were a number of ideas from that planning grant that um, we decided to move forward with this uh, new development site being one of them. I'll turn it over to Anna Velka to talk about the project. There you go. 
My name is Anivelka Cordova. Um, I'm a principal with Lemley and Wolf, and I'm here to speak on behalf of the project. So the project will be developed through a joint venture partnership between <coughs> Lemley and Wolf companies, The Bridge, and Alembic Community Development. Um, Think Architecture is our project architect, uh, which you will hear from later in the presentation. Here I'd like to summarize some of the key project highlights. The project will include an on-site social service program that will be operated by the bridge. The bridge has secured a New York, New York three social service contract from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene that will provide on-site services and rental subsidies to formerly homeless individuals with special needs for 30% of the units. The project will include hiring targets and will also offer NYCHA residents and local community members job training opportunities. On the leasing side, there will be preferences for community board members and NYCHA residents. We believe the project will help meet some of the community development goals outlined in the Make Mount Haven plan with the creation of approximately 8,500 square feet of modern and accessible commercial space and by offering affordable housing opportunities for, far, for families. <coughs> The building will include several green building features, including green roofs and open space. It will also meet Enterprise Green Communities certification. The building will provide 101 units of housing. 30% of the units will be set aside for supportive housing. The remaining 70% um, non-supportive units are designed for larger families. We'll have 24 two beds and 14 three beds, which represents 54% of non-supportive units. The units will be primarily affordable to low-income individuals and families, as well as middle-income families. Based on the preliminary underwriting and discussions with elected officials, including Council Member Ayala's office, the current ta target is summarized here in this chart and includes 68% um, of the units affordable at or below 50% AMI, and 32% of the units up to 80% AMI. This AMI distribution also assumes that eight project-based Section 8 vouchers will be secured by the development team in order to offer the deeper affordability that um, we've outlined here. Um, permanent affordability for 25% of the zoning square footage will be obtained under MIH Option 1. Um, we will be seeking a modification for, for this. Um, it was initially approved out under MIH option two. Um, however, given Council Member Ayala's feedback, we will be seeking this modification. The remaining units will be subject to extended affordability requirements. The project is expected to be financed through HPD's extremely low and low income affordability program, which is paired with HTC tax exempt bond financing and 4% tax credits. The project will also look to qualify for a 420C tax abatement. Here, just wanna highlight that we have an experienced social service provider with a great track record who's also a co-developer partner. The bridge will provide case management services for 30 formerly homeless individuals that demonstrate ability to live in independent housing. The staff will include prog a program director, a case manager, and a peer specialist. In addition to the staff, the project will have security guards during non-business hours. The development team will work with NYCHA and local community partners, including community board, uh, to market 15 construction jobs, which represents 30% of the new jobs in the project is expected to generate. In addition, the team will market six permanent jobs. Two of, the, of these positions are planned to offer union wages. The team has executed a development agreement with 32BJ confirming our commitment. Job training opportunities will also be offered to NYCHA and local residents through our partnerships with local community groups. With that, I'll turn it over to Don from Think Architecture, who will review the building. I think before we go to Don, just one second, we're just gonna uh, pause um, okay. sure. right now just to uh, open up the vote one last time. Okay. Uh, I've been joined by Council Member uh, Torres. On a continuation uh, of the vote, 
Council Member Torres. I vote aye. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member Torres. Sorry. You may proceed. Uh, okay. Uh, on a vote. Uh, Sorry. On a, on, a, on a tally of nine in the affirmative, zero uh, in the negative, and zero abstentions, the uh, items are approved and again referred to the full land use committee. Okay, uh, on the slide here, we see the uh, a view of the project from the south uh, west, uh, looking from Willis Avenue towards the project in 146th Street. Oh, excuse me, thank you. Uh, this shows the site uh, photographs. Um, the upper photograph is also from uh, the south, looking up Willis Avenue towards the site, and the lower photograph is, is uh, a closer up view of the existing one-story building. Here is the uh, proposed zoning change map, uh, existing zoning on the left. On the right, uh, the designation of an uh, R7X with, an, with a C24 commercial overlay. And here is the uh, proposed uh, mandatory inclusionary housing map. Um, and this, this view uh, from aerial view from the north uh, shows the, the NYCHA building, which is that rectangular block uh, in the foreground. And the building is, um, the proposed design is set uh, to the south. Uh, we're looking south in this, in this view. Uh, so you can see that the building is, is uh, up against 146th Street. It steps down towards uh, the NYCHA building to, uh, with a conscious design to uh, reduce the shadows uh, for the NYCHA building and also the playground, which uh, exists between the NYCHA building and this project, which is that uh, flat area just to the north of the building. And the step profile with green roofs are, are indicated. Um, this is the <coughs> site plan showing the, the, the total zoning lot, which has a NYCHA building to the north at the top of the drawing, and the project, which is a 100 by 100 foot square at the bottom of the site. And you can see the, the, the profile of the uh, green roofs. <coughs> this is the cellar level, which shows uh, uh, residential amenities in amber, the uh, uh, lower level of a community, uh, commercial space in blue, and in gray is the uh, building utilities. On the ground floor, the entrance is off 146th Street, which is, uh, leads to the lobby, shown in yellow. Immediately adjacent is the, uh, the program offices in green, and in blue uh, is, indicates the commercial tenants, uh, which is divided into two tenants, which are accessed from uh, Willis Avenue. And here's a view of the, of the close-up of the lobby. You can see the entry vestibule of the lobby, uh, the reception desk, uh, uh, mail room uh, behind in the, in the brown area to the, to the rear. Uh, access to the left is the program offices and the uh, elevator core. Uh, on the second floor, we have a, a, a featured uh, terrace. This is adjacent to the community room, and it's accessible by a stair from the lobby. Uh, and uh, so it's an, uh, an important public amenity. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, and here's a three-dimensional view of, of these, giving a sense of the scale and the activities that are, that are planned for that uh, terrace level. <coughs> this is the south elevation. Uh, we're looking north along uh, 146th Street. And you can see that the design of the building is, is sensitive to the context, where it's broken uh, the mass of the building into two, two forms the lower one aligning with the building to the, to the east, um, and, um, and that the, the, the gray zone sort of breaks up the, the building into smaller components of the, of the building mass. Next. And this is the elevation uh, on Willis Avenue, um, and you can see that, that the profile of the building here is, is as I mentioned, uh, 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 moved to the south side of the site, uh, to uh, pro provide maximum daylight into the into the playground, which is at the grade level uh, to the to the right of the NYCHA building, and in these two drawings, the these two elevations, we are indicating the uh, the mayoral override that we've uh, we have approved for intruding on the uh, required setback at both 146th Street and 100 and Willis Avenue. Uh, that's above 100 105 feet. Uh, Three-dimensional views at the 
the left hand drawing is the view from the south west uh, looking at the Willis Avenue 146th Street. On the right, we're moving around to the, towards, the, towards the east. Uh, let me go back. Uh, on the right hand drawing is, the, you can see the, uh, the residential entrance and moving around to the next slide. Uh, the view on the left is from the northwest, uh, excuse me, the northeast. Uh, and uh, you can see the, the gray is breaking up the, the building into, into small, smaller masses. Uh, and on the right is the step profile uh, and the, the, the distinction of different colors of the building uh, reducing the perceived bulk. Uh, also, we've uh, intentionally made the building uh, primarily white, which is to uh, reflect light into the neighborhood and reduce its perceived mass. Uh, a close-up view of the uh, residential entrance. Next. And a close-up view of the of the corner at Willis Avenue, 146th Street, showing the, the commercial space and a, and a, a close-up rendering of that space and also here a close-up rendering of the residential entrance. And a view from the south uh, west, uh, again, looking up uh, 146th Street and Willis Avenue. And that's our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a couple of questions. Uh, I understand that uh, the uh, affordability uh, AMIs uh, will be memorialized in the uh, HPD regulatory agreement. Uh, will it also be memorialized in uh, HPD's uh, ground lease? Uh, <coughs> yes, in uh, NYCHA's ground lease, yes. Uh, and these units uh, in the new building uh, will be subject to a community preference uh, and a NYCHA preference. Uh, can you explain how uh, those work together? There's a 50% preference uh, for community board and NYCHA residents, um, not community board, community district members, excuse me. Um, so 25% of the preference will go to NYCHA residents and 25% to community district members. Um, and what is the, the rent per year uh, for the land lease uh, on this project? Uh, the rent is uh, one dollar for the length of the ground lease. Um, and what will the city earn over the course of the lease? Uh, so it's how, how many years is the lease, and how much are you going to make at the end of it? Yeah, uh, the lease is anticipated to be ninety-nine years. Ninety-nine years. And um, it's uh, the one dollar is the complete payment for the length of the lease. Uh, and how much, how, uh, and what is the, the market rate um, for a lease of this size uh, in New York City uh, and particularly uh, in the Bronx? Um, I, I, I'm, I'd, I'd have to get back to you on, on what the uh, appraised value of the site would be. Thank you, that, that would be helpful. Um, and the, the, the council, uh, here we work very hard to ensure that New Yorkers uh, make a fair wage um, for their work. Uh, what is the plan uh, to make sure that the building service jobs uh, are good paying jobs and benefits uh, that consist with area standards uh, and the standards that are uh, enjoyed by the existing building service workers uh, at this development? Um, so we have, um planned and have proposed to the funding agencies to have livable wages for um, the super importer position in the building. And we have executed an agreement with uh, 32 VJ memorializing that. Um, so we're, we're moving forward in that direction. Great. Um, we've been joined by uh, Council Member Ayala. the hearing across the street so I won't be here long no, it's okay. but I just wanted to reiterate my support for this project um, but I also have to go on, on record and saying that while I and this is not a Lemley Wolf thing this is really for the administration I love these projects I love anything that's affordable I will take because we need them 
Um, I think that a 30% set aside, especially for a project where you only have 100 units, is a disservice to the community in a way. It allows us to do a really great thing, right, which is build our way out of the homeless epidemic, but at the same time, those 30% set aside take away from the lower income uh, AMI units that my community so desperately needs, right? And so then it, it just allows, for, we have to be you know, constantly fighting for every one unit, and I can't do that if I'm bringing in, I'm helping on the one end to meet you know, the mayor's uh, housing plan, but I'm only bringing really into the Port's Congressional District 10, 14 units at a time. I can't continue to vote on these projects in the affirmative if they're not also beneficial to the constituents that I represent, right? And so we want to do the right thing, but it needs to be done in a more equitable way. And so, again, this is not a let me wolf. I want to actually say thank you, because I think you guys have been great partners, and I know that we've been back and forth, and I apologize for that, but I have to do that, because we have to, you know, be very clear that there is, especially in communities like mine, um, a desperate need for affordable units because my constituents are being displaced at a very rapid rate. Um, and if we don't do something to address that now, it's just a revolving door because these are the same residents that are gonna end up in shelter, right? So we need to open up more opportunities for them. Um, I also have some concerns about the labor, right? We wanna make sure that we're hiring and that we're g getting good jobs for uh, individuals that, that live in this community as well. That is something that we'll continue to have a conversation about afterwards, but I just wanted to come in and say that I you know, wholeheartedly support this project and that I wish you luck and welcome you to my haven and hopefully we'll be working together for the next few years. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Um, Thank you very much um, for your testimony today. Um, if, are there any other, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Next, uh, I'm calling uh, Vinny uh, Stellato. Good morning, Chair Moya and members of the subcommittee. My name is Vinny Stellato. I'm a member at 32BJ and have been a member of 32BJ for about three years. Sorry. I'm here today on behalf of my union and as a lifelong Bronx resident. As you know, 32BJ represents more than 80,000 property service workers in New York City. We clean and maintain buildings like this one proposed. We fully support the development of affordable housing, particularly development that is 100% affordable like Batanzas 6. We are supportive of this project and we are happy to report that we are working in partnership with the development team at this project to create good building service jobs. 32BJ represents the 32 workers in the existing buildings at Batanzas. We believe that the workers at the proposed and filled development should be paid the same good wages and benefits. We understand that the development team has included this standard in the budget that they have submitted to HPD. We are calling on the city to work with the developer to ensure that this commitment to create good job, good building service jobs is fully realized. And we are urging the city council to ensure the strong wage and benefit standards for workers are part of the final plan for this project before it is approved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, are there any other members of the public uh, who wish to uh, testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application and uh, it will be laid over. Our next uh, public hearing for today is going to be on LUs 348 and 349, the Williams Bridge rezoning uh, for property in Council Member uh, Jonai's district in the Bronx. 
Uh, the applicant seeks approval of a zoning map amendment uh, to rezone a C81 district, um, one FAR to a R7A and R7A C23 district, uh, which is a 4.6 uh, FAR, and a related zoning text amendment uh, to designate the project area as a mandatory inclusionary housing uh, area utilizing option one and option two. Uh, these actions would facilitate the redevelopment of a nine-story mixed-use building, 30 residential unit, uh, MIH option one or two, uh, eight or nine units respectively, um, with uh, recreation space, uh, 16 below grade parking space, bicycle parking, and approximately 4,000 uh, 825 square feet of ground floor commercial space. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application, uh, and we are calling uh, Richard Lobel, uh, Anthony Hilla, Hilla, uh, Joseph Masia, Masha. Masha, I'm sorry, and uh, Richard uh, Vita. Council. Do you swear or affirm uh, that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? And please state your full name for the record. Richard Lobel, I do. Jo Joseph Masha, I do. Anthony Pilla, I do. Richard Vitto, I do. Thank you, Chair Moya. Council members, good morning. Richard Lobel of Sheldon Lobel, PC representing the Pilla family with regards to the Williams Bridge Road rezoning. So the rezoning is um, located in the Allerton section of the Bronx. You notice the circled portion of the map to the upper left. And this is essentially rezoning to take a C81 district and to rezone that to an R7A. So the tax map, as you see in front of you, is a uh, focused area demonstrating the lots in originally included in the rezoning. The C81 district which allows only for commercial and um, automotive uses, has been in this area since prior to 1961. And so uh, when we initially approached this rezoning, we looked to see whether or not it would be appropriate to rezone this portion to uh, a residential mixed-use district. The rezoning right now, uh, as was presented to the commission, includes seven lots. Of those seven lots, six of those had residential use uses except for one lot on Colden Avenue, which is owned by the applicant and which would be part of the development site. I'd further note that um, with regards to those six lots, one of those lots, uh, which appears at the uh, corner of Colden and Williamsbridge Road, is an existing six-story overbuilt residential building, which would become conforming pursuant to the proposed rezoning. So you can see from a land use map, again, several things from this, uh, from this graphic. First is that the area is one where there is a transit rich area. You have bus lines that abound the property on all three sides. You also have within several blocks uh, the um, uh, two and five subway lines which are um, you know, within let's say a half mile from the property site. And so as pursuant to prior rezonings in the Bronx, when you look at a transit rich area with existing residential use um, and a, a district in which many of the properties are uh, underutilized or underdeveloped, uh, it is deemed appropriate to approach the city for a residential rezoning. Uh, here you can see some pictures of the properties included within the project area. On the lower left is a picture of the existing commercial building uh, on Williamsbridge Road. This is a one and a half story building, a basement commercial with two residential units. Uh, and on the upper left you can see the frontage on Colden Avenue. This is the one story garage building, roughly 1,400 square feet. Again, the only conforming use right now within the C81 as well as the adjacent one to two family residential homes. So in accordance with this rezoning, we would just recap the, uh, the uh, zoning calculations for the benefit of the committee and the subcommittee and then be happy to answer any questions. The rezoning as proposed was for uh, seven lots and would have allowed for a nine story, 35 unit residential building on the development site. As, per, as we went through the process with the community board and then the Bronx Borough President's Office, there were certain changes made to the application to respond to co questions and comments. One of those was to um, reduce the number of units in the development, so the number of units in the development were reduced from 35 to 30, thus making this a less dense development 
which, was one, which responded to some of the concerns of the local area. And importantly, at city planning, the rezoning was reconfigured to remove the four single to two family home uh, residences on Colden Avenue, thus um, ensuring that those would not be uh, basically redeveloped within our 7A building, which was seen as being too much additional development at the time for this block. So right now, the building would only include the development site and would include the rezoning would include the property to the south of us. This property is already built to a 5.38 FAR, so it would not uh, typically be redeveloped under this scenario. The maximum FAR under the R7A is 4.6, thus it is likely that the building there would remain. So we are happy to answer any questions on behalf of the development team as well as the uh, owners of the project and, and uh, we'll leave it to the subcommittee. We've uh, had communication with, uh, with the council member, uh, council member Tonai, with regards to those options. Um, the, given the fact that this is a relatively small development, the number of units would be um, fairly equivalent. I think it would be uh, nine units of MIH pursuant to option two or eight units pursuant to option one. Um, while we leave this open for either option, we haven't really uh, extended a preference yet, so it would really be uh, in accordance with the council member's wishes. Uh, the building amenities primarily consist on the uh, on the ninth floor with an outdoor area as well as a, a physical fitness room. Um, my understanding is that the those would be limited to the building residents uh, for concerns of security and such. Sure. So we've had um, quite a long and deliberative process with the community board, uh, at which, which although the, there was a, a disapproval of the community board, it was a split vote 14 to 20. So there was, um, kind of, there was a, a, many people on the community board felt that this rezoning was too large. So in response to that, the rezoning was reduced by four properties on Colden, thus basically ensuring that those properties would not be merged and redeveloped with a larger building. And um, how does the development compare uh, in terms of height and scale in the neighborhood? I know you kind of went over that, but if you can just. Sure. Um, when we looked at the potential rezoning of the project, we looked at the fact that you have a really open area and kind of a wide street uh, and really confluence of several wide streets in front of the property. So um, we looked at other properties in the area, but particularly we're guided by the bulk of the building immediately to the south. That building is a grandfathered pre-1961 building with, as I mentioned, an FAR exceeding the R7A bulk. So when we did discuss this initially with city planning, it was deemed that R7A would be appropriate, particularly because including that building within the rezoning basically builds up, brings that building into conformance. So the use as a residential building would now be legal conforming and doesn't even cover the entirety of the bulk. So while it would be less non-complying, it would still be um, more complying than under the existing C81. We also noted that the existing C81 would permit a 21,000 square foot, that's 21,000 square foot, medical office and mixed use commercial building. And so we uh, looked at that when, looked at we, when we looked at the uh, available zoning districts and, and basically in conjunction with city planning, thought that an R7A would be most appropriate. And I just, uh, I just wanna go back. So you're saying that uh, the building amenities will not be open to all residents? No, to, to all building residents. Yeah. They'd be open to all the residents, but it wouldn't be open to the public. Got it. Thank you. Just wanted to make that clear. And that's it. Okay, thank, thank you so much for your testimony today. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Chair, Council Appreciate members. It. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Um, seeing none, I now close uh, the public hearing on this application and uh, it will be laid over. This concludes uh, today's meeting and I would like to thank uh, the members of the public, uh, my colleagues, uh, 
big shout out to Council Member Lanceman for uh, sticking it through to the end, uh, and Council Land Use and their staff uh, for their great work. Uh, this meeting is hereby adjourned.